My name is Sophie Scholl. My story is one of internal non-violent resistance within Germany. Between 1942 and 1943, my brother and I led the student resistance group, the White Rose. We wrote leaflets urging our fellow Germans to stop supporting the Nazis. My name is Nancy Wake. Unlike Sophie, I wasn't resisting from inside Germany. I was part of the French resistance, so my story is one of external military resistance. The Gestapo nicknamed me the White Mouse because I escaped them so many times and I was their most wanted person in the whole war. The Nazis offered a reward of five million francs to anyone who captured me. I lived in the woods, communicating with the British whilst destroying important German infrastructure. We represent two very different stories of resistance. And while we tell you about our lives, we invite you to compare and contrast our motives, our challenges and our successes. We hope that this will help you to better understand who resisted, what they did and why, as well as allowing you to judge the impact we had during and after the war. Very few people inside Germany actively resisted, although what resistance looked like isn't always easy to define, since it could include everything from telling a joke about Hitler to attempting to assassinate him. You might be wondering why more Germans did not resist the Nazis. Well, when I discovered the first leaflet, I suddenly knew exactly why. It is certain that today every honest German is ashamed of his government. Therefore, every individual must defend himself as best he can at this late hour, offer passive resistance, resistance wherever you may be, before it is too late, before the nation's last young man has given his blood on some battlefield for the hubris of a subhuman. Hans, what is this? It looks like a leaflet to me. I know it's a leaflet, but... I think you wrote it. Alright, it's true. I did write it. Hans, this is so dangerous. Nazi Germany is full of spies. If they caught you with this, they could report you to the Gestapo, and it's impossible to know who to trust. So I wasn't spotted, was I? I know, but if these are traced back to you, then our family is in danger. You could be arrested, tortured, or even killed for resisting the Nazis. And the same could be done to our family. Sophie, it will be okay. As long as I keep pretending on the outside that I'm a good Nazi and make sure I'm not seen with the leaflets, it will be all right. After the war, it became clear that in reality, the Gestapo was actually a very small organisation. In 1939, they only had 20,000 officers to cover the whole country, and most of those were office workers, not field agents. They depended on informants, ordinary Germans who reported on their neighbours, colleagues and friends, either out of fear political commitment to the Nazis, or because of the personal grudges. Even so, at the time, the Gestapo had a reputation for being all-seeing and all-knowing, and this created an atmosphere of fear and suspicion within Germany. The isolation and the need to pretend to be supporting the Nazis are two of the key differences between resistance inside and outside of Germany. Both types of resistance were dangerous, but inside Germany you had to operate alone because trusting anyone was a risk. Unlike Sophie, I was never alone. I was the leader of 7,000 resistant fighters. And we were supported by the British Special Operations Executive, who supplied us with food, training and weapons in exchange for our help with their military operations and information about the Germans. Additionally, because we were working to free France, local French people were often more than happy to help us. Our resistance was designed to prevent the Nazis' military being able to work effectively. We blew up train lines so they could not move troops or supplies around, and we destroyed communication technologies so they couldn't call for backup or reveal what the Allies were doing. This was especially effective on D-Day. We also engaged in actual fighting when we needed to, helped shot down Allied pilots escape France and sheltered Jews who were fleeing from the Nazis. Hans and I could only have dreamed of having the same amount of backup as Nancy and the resistance fighters. Instead, it was just us two together, and in the end, our luck ran out. Your full name? Sophie Magdalena Scholl. Age? 21 years old. You are being interrogated today in connection with the printing and distribution of several seditious leaflets, calling for the disaffection of the National Socialism, passive resistance, 
and sabotage. Are you committed to National Socialism? No. Why not? I perceive the intellectual freedom of people to be limited in such a manner as contradicts everything inside of me. I personally would like to have nothing to do with National Socialism. And this is why you produced the leaflets? I must continue to deny that I have even the least to do with the production and distribution of the leaflets in question. Your brother Hans has already confessed. It is useless to suppress what you know. I knew then that it was useless to continue proclaiming my ignorance. If Hans had confessed, there was only one thing I could do. Make sure the smallest number of other people would be drawn into this situation. I had to protect my friends. Throughout the rest of my interrogations, I repeatedly denied everyone else's involvements and placed all of the blame on myself and my brother. In that case, I will confess. Good. Why did you and your brother write those leaflets? We were convinced that Germany had lost the war and that every life that is sacrificed for this lost cause is sacrificed in vain. But why did you decide to write leaflets? Nothing was being done that would shorten the war by even one day. My brother and I agreed that we, and we alone, would find both method and means of effectively communicating our views to the masses. Explain the events of the morning of February 19th, 1943. My brother and I brought these leaflets into the university. Inside the university building, I stacked or scattered the leaflets in various places. In my high spirits or stupidity, I made the mistake of throwing about 80 to 100 leaflets from the third floor down into the atrium, whereupon my brother and I were discovered. The university's maintenance man stormed up to us and said, I place you under arrest. After your arrest and interrogation, do you not conclude that your actions must be considered a crime against the common good? From my point of view, I must answer no. Now as before, I believe I have done the best that I could do for my nation. I therefore do not regret my conduct. I wish to take upon myself the consequences of my actions. I herewith indict Sophia Scholl for jointly undertaking the following actions. 1. Preliminary actions of high treason with intention of changing the constitution of the Reich by force. 2. Aiding and abetting the enemies of the Reich here at home and inflicting damage on the ability of the Reich to wage war. This during a time of crisis in the Reich. 3 seeking to publicly cripple and destroy the will of the German people for militaristic self-determination. What we said and wrote is what many people are thinking. Only they don't dare say it. Fraulein Shaw, your leaflets have propagated defeatist thinking and vilified the Fuhrer in a most vulgar manner, therefore dishonouring Germany and aiding and abetting the enemies of the Reich and demoralising our armed forces. Now, if you had known and thought over all these things that I have now explained to you, you certainly would never, surely, have let yourself be swept along in acts of this kind, would you? You are wrong. I would do exactly the same next time, for it is you, not I, who has the mistaken world view. Very well. Then, before we announce our verdict, have you anything else to say? If my brother is sentenced to death, then I must not, and ought not, to receive a lighter sentence. My guilt is exactly the same as his. The Nazis sentenced me and Hans to death, and we were beheaded by guillotine on the same day as our trial. Hans's final words were, Long live freedom. Often, it is said that the resistance inside Germany did not achieve anything substantial because it ultimately failed in its attempts to get rid of the Nazis. But I think that the severe way they punished me and my brother shows how afraid the Nazis were about the impact we could have had on the re regime. Sophie's actions were creating a psychological threat to the Nazis, whereas the external resistance was causing a physical damage. 
We were so effective and were causing the regime so much trouble that the Nazis planned a secret mission to wipe us out. Thankfully, we were well organised, prepared and forewarned so we managed to escape. However, in the process we lost one of our most valuable possessions. Is everyone okay? Did anyone get hit? Denny, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, but I had to get rid of the radio. They were on to me. We don't have any communication. How are we going to speak to the British? What are we going to do? We need to get a message back to London. I have a plan. Without our communication codes and radio, we would be on our own, unable to be supplied by the British, whilst also being unable to communicate our information to them. There was only one thing to do. Find another resistance group and get them to pass a message to London. The problem was, the nearest resistance group was 250 kilometres away and to get there we had to go through Nazi controlled towns. We couldn't go by car, it would draw too much attention. So instead, I cycled the 500 kilometre round trip in less than 72 hours so we could restore our link to the British. As a woman, I was able to blend into society more effectively than the men and I also used my good looks as a sort of disguise throughout the war to fool the Nazis into believing I wasn't a threat. Before we can judge how successful our resistance was, it is important to understand what we were aiming to do. For external resistance, whilst our overall aim was to get rid of the Germans, our smaller aims included supporting the Allies and causing the Nazis as many problems as possible. We achieved both of these things. For me, within Germany, isolated and without external support, there was a limit to what we could hope and achieve. We knew we couldn't bring down Hitler on our own, even though we wanted to. So instead, we tried to encourage people within Germany to think for themselves, to stop believing in Hitler and show their dissatisfaction through acts of sabotage. Whilst it is true that neither internal or external resistance succeeded in getting rid of Hitler on their own, we achieved other things such as rescuing shot down Allied soldiers and helping them escape, or sheltering Jews who had escaped Nazi persecution. These actions had a huge impact on the individuals we helped, even if it could be argued that the overall impact was small. In the longer term, after the war, the fact there had been the resistance became significant in Germany and all the nations which had been invaded. People wanted to show that they hadn't simply just let the Nazis do whatever they wanted, so examples of resistance became really important for national morale. It is up to you to decide how effective or important you think resistance to the Nazis was or continues to be. What behaviours counted as resistance, small scale victories versus large scale goals and the impact of resistance in the long and short terms are all important. But remember, context is everything. When making your judgments, keep in mind what is possible under the circumstances we are living in. And ask yourself, if you were in our situation, what would you have done?